My name is Claudia Swafford Haltom. Today is June the 8th, 2001. I am in Nashville, Tennessee to interview my mother, Claude Galbraith Swafford. This interview is taking place as part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. When did you first start thinking you might want to be a lawyer? I guess about the sixth grade. I was in, uh, I lived in Greenville, Tennessee. I was born in Greenville, grew up there, went to school, uh, to the Crescent School, which was considered a model school, and had wonderful memories, good teachers. And by the fifth grade, uh, I had a teacher who probably is the most impressive teacher of my whole life. And she would organize our room into city government. And we elected aldermen by the rows. We had uh, five aldermen. We had five rows, and so you were elected. Each row had an alderman. And then when all the aldermen were elected, we elected mayor. And so she gave us the concept of uh, involvement and responsibility. We didn't know that that was it, mm -hmm. but it was, it was, we were highly interested in it. Mm -hmm. And everybody was into the game, some more than others. My best friend was not interested in politics. She mm -hmm. could care less. She'd vote like I wanted her to, no matter what, and uh, could care less about politics. But some of us really took an interest, and I guess that's the way it is today. Mm -hmm. And then by the sixth grade, I was really more interested, and we were having elections in school, like we'd have the May Queen and all of that. And so I remember running for all, Go ahead. running for all those jobs, or all those whatever. Uh -huh. And then by the seventh grade, <clears throat> that was in junior high, and we had wonderful uh, teachers in junior high school. Uh -huh. The woman who taught, uh, we didn't call it social studies; we called it was Tennessee history. So we fought the Civil War all over again. And we took sides and uh, there was a uh, boy in that class that I'd gone through all the way through, started in church kindergarten with. He was on one side and I was on the other. Who was that? That was, uh, his name was Tommy Hall. He later went to UT Law School, <clears throat> later became a district judge, East Tennessee. And Tommy and I see each other still today. And um, he was in service and was a little bit behind me in law school. But I went on to law school out of, first I went to Tusculum College. And then I went to UT Law School. Did you and Tommy talk about going to law school? Yeah, I don't really were... think we did. I don't rec if we did, I don't recall it. And um, from the schools in Greenville, you went to Tusculum College. Yes, Tusculum College is a, is a Presbyterian school, well, the oldest school east of the Alleghenies, west of the Alleghenies. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's in the mountains of East Tennessee. It's a Presbyterian school, still there, still a good school. I went there because my father was quite old and I felt like I couldn't leave home. and so. And the business. Tell me about well, running the business. My father was in a business that uh, is no more. I mean, you know, it's there are things that come and go, and our your era would have no idea of how people heated their homes. They did it with coal, and they in the summertime they bought ice. They had ice boxes. Greenville, Green County did not have rural did not have electrification out in the county. Greenville was a green county. It was a very good um, farming area. People lived on big farms, lived well, <coughs> but did not have electricity. So as my father always said, um, selling frozen water is good money. So we had the ice plant in town and we sold ice during the summertime and coal during the wintertime. And then it was also a tobacco area. Mm -hmm. And so we would use the same fleet of trucks that we used for ice and coal, we would use it in the tobacco market. And so my father was 60 years old when I was born. 
so by the time I was, I cannot remember when I first started going to work with him. I cannot remember because I started early and he didn't drive. And so he always had somebody, some of the men who worked for him would drive him. And so he just took me, took me with him. And uh, so by the time I was 14, I was going, we called it the plant. I was going to the plant and I was learning how to uh, do the things that you did. Check out the ice and I mean in the summertime we ran 24 hours a day and we had to go down there and see that the ice was in the cold storage and ready to go out in the morning. Tell me about how you stepped in to help run the plant. Well, when I was a senior in high school, um, I was really kind of bored by the time I was a senior because I had the credits I needed to graduate. And uh, so they had a program in high school that we could go to school in the morning and get a job in the afternoon. So I worked in an insurance company, which was just a really interesting job, interesting people. The man who owned the insurance company had lots of involvement in the city. He, by the way, he was the mayor of the town at a later point. And he was interested in politics. So I was working for him and, uh, in the afternoon, and I was, became sort of involved. And Greenville was a small town, but a very, very good town. Lots of interesting people and lots of well-to-do people. So I was talking one day to a man on the street uh, that I'd come to know in the insurance company. And he said to me, uh, if you're so, if you've got to work somewhere, you know, as though that was a foolish thing to do, why would you work? Why would a woman, why would a girl work? Uh, what she should do is go to college a little bit and then try to make the best marriage possible. But he said, and I do remember almost what he said, if you've got to work, why don't you go down and help your daddy? They're stealing him blind. And I guess he had about um, 30 people working for him at that time. <clears throat> and many of them had worked for him a long time and were trusted, but it's, it's sort of true that if you turn things over to people without any supervision, things get out of So when go did wrong. you go down? So I says to him, well, when I get out of high school, uh, I'll start working full time at the plant. And we thought that was great. And so sometime after that, he said to me, well, uh, I don't think this is going to work down there. You know, um, there are some really w rough men who work there. And you just would sort of be out of place down there. And uh, the man who was, who was really his, the person who was running the business, who was operating the business, um, he's just not comfortable with my daddy didn't use the word comfortable, but he didn't want me. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, that sounds to me like all the more reason for why I should go. And finally, then my daddy never denied me anything, never whipped me, never told me no, except he didn't think I should do that. And I said, well, I'm going to go anyway. So on Monday morning, June the 6th, 1944, after I'd graduated from high school on Friday night, by the way, we didn't have wild parties back then when you graduated from high school. For one thing, there weren't any boys around in 1944. Uh, I appeared down at the ice plant to work, down at the plant to work. And so Daddy says, well, Charlie's going to quit if you come. He just doesn't want you. And he's going to quit. So sure enough, I appeared on the scene and no Charlie. And, and I was worried, I will have to say this, because although I had been going since I was 14 years, I do remember going at 14, specifically. Uh, of course, I didn't know anything about how to operate a business. And, uh, my, but my daddy was um, a real stalwart, a man of really extraordinary common sense and very practical about getting along with people. <clears throat> so we worked for two or three weeks and there were other people there who helped me out and there was another man who uh, was just sort of stepped in and showed me what to do and showed us how to carry on and showed us how to get the orders out and the trucks checked out and the money checked in. 
the bank deposits made. It was during the war, 1944, and uh, we it was a fairly it was an old established business, and we had business. It was just a matter of taking care of it. And so, when did you start college? Well, in September that summer, I stayed at the plant, and in September, I started thinking about well, how can I go to college? And I thought, well, I can go to Tusculum in the morning, and then I can come home and work in the afternoon. And so in 44, I did enroll out at the University of Tennessee. Oh, by that time, I had an uncle who had retired, but was a farmer, and was a fairly young man. Oh, I'd say maybe in his early 50s. And so uncle, his name was Albert Smith. And so I went out and I said, well, how about coming down and working for us? And he did, and he was just wonderful. And what did your mother think about all this? Well, mother never really had a clue. She just was at home, and uh, my mother was older too. And she was whatever I wanted to do, you know. I guess I did. And your brother? I had a brother who was uh, two years younger, and so he was, was in school at TMI at that time. And he was never interested in the business. He joined the Air Force out of, well, I've forgotten, sometime during the war mm -hmm. and was gone. But he never had an interest in the business. And so you were going to college and working at the ice plant. And what was the progression then to the University of Tennessee? Well, um, that the, the fall of 44, I was able to do a full 44 and 45, I was able to do a full year of college. And uh, then my father died in February of 45, and I started to college in 45, fall of 45. And um, I finished that Tusculum was on the semester basis. UT was on the quarter basis back then. And I finished uh, that fall semester of 45 at Tusculum, and I was just so overwhelmed with working and trying to uh, keep things going there. The war, the, the, see, the war had ended in 45. The war ended in April of 45, and Greenville was a really booming little town after the war. And our business was very good. We had lots of business. And uh, so I just thought I should not go back to school that semester. That would have been the semester of 46. And by, summer, by summertime, though, I began to think, how am I going to get down to the University of Tennessee? And how am I going to go to law school? And I had heard that you could go to law school if you had two years of college. And by that time, I had a year and a half of college. So we knew a man, I knew a man who was at the University of Tennessee from Greenville that had been a friend of my father's, a really good friend. And so he was in the, um, he was in the administration. I, I don't remember what his title was, I just knew him. So I just remembered going to Knoxville one day catching the bus and going to Knoxville and taking a taxi cab out to the University of Tennessee and looking up a man by the name of Grady Atkinson and knocked on his door and said, I'm here. <laughs> I'd like to go to law school. How do I do it? And he said, well, uh, first of all, you got to get two years. You have to have two years of college and you don't have it. I guess I'd taken my transcript. And so he said, but I think we can get you into school here this summer and we can get you enough um, hours that you can go to law school in September. And so I had enough. I like six hours at the end of the summer. I like six hours. So I had a wonderful, I remember there's, you know, it was, UT was kind of small then and pretty, it was not impersonal like it is today. And I had a very interesting professor who says, well, I tell you what, you can take six hours of, um, um, correspondence. You can take a correspondence course. We can get you six hours there and that'll give you enough to qualify to get into UT. So that's what I did. And so we had about six weeks between summer school and fall quarter starting. And I came mm -hmm. home and took those, uh, uh, and I remember I worked on those. I, I know I took sociology, which of course was a really easy course. And I can't remember what else I took, but I know I had mm -hmm. six hours. 
and, and, uh, and then I know right before mm -hmm. school started in September, and I don't know that you want to know this, mm -hmm. but right before school started in September, I thought, well, I better get down to law school and tell them I'm coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not really, but anyway, uh, um, I know my mother and my brother, my brother was home from the service, and uh, so we says, I said, well, I need to go to Knoxville, and they said, well, we'll take you. So I knew where the law school was. The law school is, of course, no more at the University of Tennessee. It was behind the Church Street Methodist Church. It was an old, beautiful building, three stories, no elevator, small building, very small building. Um, so they just pulled up in front of the school there on West Cumberland. And I said, well, I'll go in and be back in a minute. Well, I was gone about 20 minutes. And I went up to the third floor. I knew where the office was. I knew where the law school was. I knew where the law school was. I knew where the office was. And I don't remember that there was any registration. I just know that uh, I went up to the office and said, how do I register to go to law school? I, I did have that much knowledge about it that you did have to register uh, and I don't I think it was uh, somebody who worked in the office who just gave me a paper to fill out and the one of the uh, uh, traumatic experiences was she says what do you want to take and I said well uh, what is there to take <laughs> and I remember her saying torts and I thought well, what is torts and I and then she said contracts and um, uh, I knew what contracts was. I'd had enough experience that I knew what contracts were. And then she said uh, domestic relations, and I knew what that was because I had I would go to court in Greenville, I, you know, so I knew that was getting divorces. That's equated to divorces. And so I thought that'll be really interesting. I, so I'd take domestic relations and contracts and equity, I believe. And everybody, it seems that torts to this day is a freshman class. Is it? And so I took torts, and then I had four. Um, so that's how I went to law school. Well, now, when you went in to register or to talk to your father's friend, did anyone suggest that all these men coming back from the service might be filling up the spaces or that there wouldn't be room for you because so many men coming back? Well, that was, um, that was the summer of 46, and they had not begun to the real the real push came, I'd say, in the fall of 46. I mean, the University of Tennessee was almost a skeleton, I'm told, during the war, the war years. And um, it was at the end, the, see, the war was not over until April of 1945. Japan surrendered in April of 1945. And they were being mustered out or whatever it is. It, take, it took some time. To, and then, of course, the bill, the GI Bill of Rights, that began to kick in. And then those, all those returning service people were able to go to college. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had money to go. Now, your daddy was one of those, your father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, was, he, he had gotten out and had already been in law school. And so he came back in January of 46. So he was there as a second-year law student when I enrolled as a first-year law student. Mm -hmm. And where did you live when you went to law well, school? Well, this friend that I mentioned was living in a house on West Cumberland Street next door to a condo courts. The condo courts is still there, but uh, there was a house, and it was a boarding house. It was a three-story boarding house and lots of people lived in that house and he thought I should live there and he'd sort of keep an eye on me and um, uh, so I lived, had a room there and it was 15, 18, no one. It was on, it was across the street from the old Five Gam house mm -hmm. and I lived in that house that summer and then that fall I was able to get a room in the dormitory. In which dormitory did you live in? Well, at that point it was called um, Polly McClung, but it was a part of what they called the Sophronia Strong Units. But there were about five units in that mm -hmm. complex, and I lived in Polly McClung. Mm -hmm. And Polly was on the corner, and Polly was uh, uh, 
just a great place to be in Knoxville in 94, 1946. Tell me about going into law school, your first day, if you can remember. I do remember the first day. As a matter of fact, I remember Shirley Baumgartner. She's now Judge Underwood. And I even remember what Shirley had on. And, uh, and I also remembered that she sort of acts like she knows what she's doing. And her father was an attorney. And Shirley was the, the first day. It was, uh, it was in tort. It was uh, the torts. It was class. And torts was probably the most boring subject because the professor was boring. But he was a good professor and very courteous. You know, I never, the word discrimination is not a word of my era. Discrimination has come about in the last 25 years. I didn't know. The only thing that I remember is, well, they don't think I'm really serious about this, but I'll show them. How many women were in law there school with you? Do you remember who oh, they were? very well, very well. Shirley, myself, a woman by the name of Nell Williams, and her husband. He had been in service, and they came to law school together as a couple, and they were wonderful, supportive friends. And another young woman by the name of Betty Williams, and none of us have ever heard of, or know what happened to Betty Williams. She lived in Knoxville. She was very a very good student, a very quiet person you'd never mm -hmm. think of as being interested in going to law school. Mm -hmm. Very pretty. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me some other experiences from law school. Was, did, was there a men's uh, card playing room in yes, the law school? Yes, yes. The law school was three, as I said, it was three stories. The, store, the floor you went on into off of the street, off of West Cumberland there, was um, there was a big room where, what was it called? It was called, well, I can't remember what it was, but it was sort of a lounge, and uh, that's, uh, there was always a bridge game going on there always a bridge game and there were always law students play bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, play bridge, stay up all night and smoke. <laughs> and so one of the things somebody had advised me, oh, people were giving me advice about going to law school and they were kind of interested and in, why would I go to law school? Um, they said don't go in the, um, don't go in that room, just don't go in there um, because that will be sort of offensive to the men. If you really want to get along with the men, just sort of don't, Im don't impose on every area of their life. I guess that was the thinking. So uh, I never did go in there. And one day your daddy came out and says, uh, come in and play bridge with us. And uh, well, I didn't play bridge. <laughs> I couldn't play bridge, but I learned. And, but I didn't, I didn't. And that was an, that was always sort of an off limits for the. I felt like it. I don't know why. I just never did go. Mm -hmm. But I never did feel. I never did feel that I was mistreated in law school. As a matter of fact, the legal profession then, more so than today, was a profession of nobility and gentility. And even if they weren't gentlemen at heart, they behaved in law school and mm -hmm. in the courts. They did. Mm -hmm. There was a there was a modicum of behavior that was observed, mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed that, especially since I'd worked in an element of pretty rough, uneducated people. It was a pleasure to be in an atmosphere like that. Mm -hmm. And. Um when you were in law school, who were some of the friends that you sat with in class? Well, uh, I guess the most prominent member of my class was Howard Baker. I didn't sit with him because uh, he always sat in the back and I always tried to sit up close because I could pay better attention when I sat up close. And uh, Howard Baker was, I remember hearing his voice the first time. I heard this wonderful deep voice. And I thought, who is that? So I looked around, and it was a really young. It looked like he was about 12 years old. I've told him that uh -huh. since, and he had a lot of hair, a lot of hair. Not long, like in your day, but a lot of 
a big shock of hair. And he was, um, had a great voice, as he does today. You know, he has this, a mellow voice. And I had a mellow voice. But then I sat between, um, you just sort of settled into uh, your own little nook, I guess. And I sat between these two nice young men who were, they were both married. And, uh, but they were returned. They had come back from service. And uh, they briefed, they would always make carbon copies. The way law school worked then, as it does somewhat today, is the case Methodist, where you study cases, and you brief your cases, you come to class, you discuss them, and uh, that was the way law school was conducted. So each, each, each subject, we would have a certain number of cases to brief, and they always would make me a carbon copy. And they were good. They were both smart. One later became a circuit judge. The other one went into service and retired in service. But they were both really in highly intelligent. And so I sat between them, and um, they would always brief my cases for me. Now, well, no, I, you know, I would try. I was making my best effort, and I studied. My roommates say that I really studied all the time. I didn't remember that I did that. But uh, they were very helpful. One was named... Chester Mahood. One was named Jim Mitchell. And I saw Chester Mahood a couple of years ago. He's, of course, retired now. And he told me a funny story that um, your husband, your daddy, Howard Swafford, was, of course, a year ahead of me. And he was so, um, your daddy was so, uh, uh, well, smart, for a bit, lack of a better word. Um, uh, he would go through the waste paper cans and see if there were any old exams. And one of the teachers, one of the professors had thrown away an exam. And your daddy gave it to me and he said, you know, this might be useful to you sometime. And sure enough, that exam was given on one of those courses later on down the road. And Chester Mahood was telling me that story. He said, you know, you brought an exam to class that we studied and uh, all made a good grade on it. And I do recall not studying that exam, thinking nothing will happen about that. And they were laughing about that. Now, when did you meet Howard Swafford? Um, let's see. In February of 1957. He was um, a friend of, um, he was a friend of um, Tom Pruitt. 47. What did I say? 57. 47, all mm -hmm. right, 47. Mm -hmm. And they were all in the same fraternity. And they were, uh, they were always going out together. And so he called me up one night and said, let's go out. So we went out with Tom Pruitt. And who is Tom Pruitt? Tom Pruitt was a lawyer. Uh, well, he later was a lawyer who went back to Memphis and practiced law there for many, many years. Uh, a prominent lawyer. His father, when he was in law school, his father was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Of Tennessee. That's right. Justice Alan Pruitt. And he was, uh, he had a brother, Alan Pruitt. He was in law school too. So we were all sort of together in that group. And um, so that was, let's see, in February of 47. The, the, there was a place in Knoxville called Southland, and that was the place to go. And so we all went out to Southland. That was our, that was our first date. And then the second date, one Thursday, one Sunday afternoon, he called me up and says, "Let's go to Gatlinburg." So we went to Gatlinburg. So the next time around, they had the big thing in Knoxville was the Nahealy dances. The Nahealy dances lasted three days. They started out on Friday night. And then there was a tea dance on Saturday afternoon. And then there was a really big bash on Saturday night. And then they had name band, big name bands, big name. I'm trying to think. Tommy Dorsey, the real Tommy Dorsey. Uh, oh, just wonderful bands. And you bought um, the, whole, the whole set of tickets. And you thing was to be asked for the whole series. 
And, uh, but your daddy bought just one of the three. Some of his friends, they had, they bought one set and they divided them up. So uh, <laughs> I remember that I was going. Um, I was going, but I wasn't too delighted with who and how I was going, but I was going. And so he called me up and says, well, what about going on Saturday night? Now, I don't know if you want to put this in or not. And so I had to, you needed three evening dresses. And I had one new one, one new one, and two old ones. And so I decided the night that I was going with him to wear my new one. I wasn't going to do that. So I decided to wear my new one with him. And so then we went to that dance, and he was um, he was really dashing. He, you know, he was a returned uh, Navy aviator, and uh, sort of feeling his oats. <laughs> <laughs> a senior in law school had already taken the bar exam. Then you could take the bar exam, and you didn't really have to continue practicing law. Once you took the bar exam, you could practice law. <laughs> but he did. He finished up and he graduated and has a degree. And you went uh, to law school for two years. Yeah, I did. And then tell me what happened and your progression then to uh, Jasper, Tennessee and Marion County. Well, two years, six quarters translated into two years whenever you got them. I mean, you know, if you went straight through the summer, six quarters was two years of law school. So I did go, I had, I had six quarters. <coughs> By March uh, 1948, I had six quarters. And when you had six quarters, you could then, you were then, could, were eligible to take the bar. You had to have six quarters to take the bar exam. So at the end of my six quarters, um, at that point, your daddy had already graduated, had come back to Marion County, and uh, was, had been practicing law there for a year. He, he graduated in 47 been practicing law. He came back to Knoxville frequently uh, after he graduated. And we married in May of 1948 in Greenville. <coughs> I, did, <coughs> I did not go to law school anymore after March. After I did, took the bar exam after we married. And then you moved to Marion County? I moved to Marion County. And you all lived in what town? South Pittsburgh. And tell me about your first job at well, that point. Well, let's see. I was, um, we were living in South Pittsburgh and um, not, were very, very shy, of fun, very short of funds because, see, your daddy was just, he was in his second year of practicing law with this firm. And the senior member of the firm certainly didn't believe in paying junior. He was a partner by that time, but did not believe in paying much money to the junior partners. So I didn't have a job. And I'd been there about uh, two months, I guess. And he came home one day, and I was reading the paper. That was about all there was to do. And I'd read the paper and walk up and down the street and uh, got to know a few people. And it was not a, I was really wanting to work. And he says to me, well, Judge Ralston's secretary, last night, she was at work. Today, she's not at work. She had left with her boyfriend. <laughs> and so he didn't have notice and didn't, was not out looking for somebody to work for him. So he was desperate for a secretary. He was about 75 and still had a pretty good practice. Still was fairly busy. And they had two offices. They had an office in Jasper, which was the county seat where your daddy was with one of the other lawyers. And then Judge Ralston was in South Pittsburgh. And tell me who Judge Ralston And Judge was. Ralston had been the presiding judge of the, what we refer to as the monkey trial, the evolution trial up in Ray County in Dayton in 1925. And he was the, the circuit judge and presided over that case. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the uh, high point of his whole life, that case. He was a real celebrity. And how did he then go back into the practice of law? Well, he he was defeated. He was you run for circuit judge, as you well know, and he was defeated in 1925. 
and he came back into the practice of law and made a very, uh, he was a very well-known lawyer before he became judge, and then he had a very distinguished practice from 1925 till about 1950. And he, in that, during that time, had acquired a lot of property. It was generally thought of as being probably the richest man in the county, or one of them, anyway, and represented uh, the people who could afford to pay a lawyer. And then he also represented people who couldn't. And he also was uh, the uh, counsel for what was the Tennessee Coal Iron and Railroad Company. And that was the last case he ended on, and that was the last case I worked with him on. By that time, I'd passed the bar, and by that time, I'd sort of, uh, well, I don't know that I'd become a, a colleague exactly, but we really sort of sang off of the same page. Well, how did you feel going to work as his secretary that first day? Well, I went down to see him to get a job. I just wanted a job. I had not passed the bar at that point. I just wanted something to do. And... Uh, he uh, asked me if I could type, and I said, oh, I'd had typing in high school. And so, of course, I said I could, but I was really, I couldn't type. <laughs> I couldn't type. Well, you know, I could get the paper in the machine, and I had the rudiments of typing, but so far as, fortunately, he didn't ask me how many minutes I could type. Huh. And uh, so, I, one of the things we talked about was what he would pay me. I didn't ask. I wasn't going to ask, but he asked me, you know, what I would need to have. And I said, well, what did you pay your last secretary? And he said, well, $125 a month. And I said, well, uh, I would work for that. And he said, well, she had worked there for several years before she made that much money, and that would be all I could ever make. He would never pay more than $125. I do remember that. And I said, well, if that's all I'm going to ever make, I just might as well start with that. And so we, uh, we got along very well. Judge Ralston was, uh, uh, was, the people in town looked with some awe up to, to Judge Ralston. He wore uh, tailored, beautiful tailored suits. He wore stiff, stiff starched car collars that had to be attached to his shirt. He wore black Stetson hats. Uh, he was, um, you know, he was recognizable in town. He drove uh, an old Chevrolet car. His wife drove the biggest, blackest Buick in town, the longest Buick in town. And so everybody knew Judge Ralston. And I, you were given a little bit of, um, uh, by working for him, I didn't really realize it at the time, but people knew that you worked for Judge Ralston. And he would send me around to collect his rent. And he would, uh, I got to the point I was even filling out his income taxes. And uh, so we, we, I worked for him for two years. I'm sure I would not have passed the bar, but for Judge Ralston. And how did he help you with that? Uh, when we were not doing something, when we were not busy, he had a room that he didn't use very much, but it was, he was, he had, he had him a really nice office that in case he wanted to impress clients, he could take them in that office. He stayed in his library most of the time. And he would make me go back to that room, and he would talk to me about what I would need to know on the bar exam. So you felt he was helpful oh, and supportive? Oh, he was very supportive. He was very encouraging, and, uh, you know, if the time came when uh, he would tell people that, that I'd gone to law school. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last case he had, when your daddy went into service, he was recalled during the Korean War. So, of course, with that, I was going to try to go with him. And so I told Judge I would have to leave. And I did leave. And um, after I left, he, they, the case that he had, there was, he had a case that was a land dispute case that had roots that went back 30 years, I guess. And so it, he, had, uh, he had 15, he called them volumes on that particular land. 
and uh, it was a big tract of land, and he knew more about that land than anybody. There's a lot of mountain land in that area, Marion County and Grundy County, and there was this was a dispute that would have cost, uh, had he lost it, it would have cost the party a big holding, a big land holding. So that was the last, I went back after I, after I, after your daddy was in service and stayed and we briefed that case and that was his last case that he argued before the Supreme Court. And when you and my father married, did you all have discussion about joining the Bar Association? Well, the Bar Association of Tennessee then was certainly uh, a bastion of the good old boys. I mean, the, you talk about the bar and the bench. Well, that, the bar and the bench were, they were certainly all male, all men. And there, I guess there were a few women, but we did not see them at the bar meetings. And I remember in 47, that was before we married, there, the bar was in, in uh, Nashville. And I remember him writing me about taking Judge Ralston uh, over to Nashville. And it was held at the uh, Maxwell, the old Maxwell house. And I remember him telling me about what a good time he had had. And uh, I don't know, there was always just sort of this unseen, unspoken, well, you know, really the legal profession is for men. <laughs> so did you tell <laughs> him that men. you wouldn't go to the conventions? Some kind of conversation I rashly, uh, in my effort to, to please him, I guess, said that I wouldn't expect to attend the bar meetings. Okay, and so then <laughs> did you go to the next one? In 1948, we, in June, it was in Chattanooga, the Lookout Mountain Hotel. And uh, they did invite the ladies to the banquet. That was the way that they trotted out the well-to-do lawyers. <laughs> I guess invited all of them, their wives. And so I went to the banquet with one of the partners, a Mrs. Ralston, another Mrs. Ralston, uh, and we all went over to the, uh, up to Lookout Mountain, to the Lookout Mountain Hotel. That's where it was. And that was the portion that I went to in 1948. That was the only thing I participated in 1948. In 1949, it was held in Memphis at the Peabody Hotel. And um, so, I, went, I came <laughs> to, and uh, it was, but Memphis then was, I mean, to come to the Bar Association, I mean, you thought about what you were going to wear, and you bought new clothes if you could afford them, and uh, there were really, it, it was a grand event. What was the Peabody like? The Peabody was the grand, the grandest place, as it is today. It's really little changed today. It's restored to its grandeur. And um, there were lots of things to do. One of the things your daddy did, he rep they represented back then, they were the local council for what they call the NC and SANL. And they had a big dinner. For what was that? That was the Nashville NC, Nashville and St. Louis Railroad Company. And so they entertained all of their council. And your daddy, of course, naturally, no women at that, naturally. And I remember, though, there were other women there at that time. There were women who, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the partner's wives and I, we came to that convention together. And I remember that time there was a restaurant behind, behind the Peabody but in the name of Anderton's. And Anderton's was the best place to eat. I mean, not the best place, but a good place to eat. And so we would always go to Anderton's when we would come to Memphis to eat. And uh, that was in 49, and I don't think we missed a convention until your daddy, uh, well, when he was two years, he was in service again when he was recalled. In Korea, of course, we didn't go, but when he came back, and the bar at that time rotated. It would be in uh, Memphis, in Nashville, and periodically in Chattanooga and Knoxville, they sort of swapped out. They didn't, I can't remember exactly, maybe ever six years in Knoxville and ever six years in Chattanooga, but ever three years in Memphis and Nashville. 
And, but it was great fun, and we knew all the people. And at that time, all the people we'd gone to law school were. It's interesting about the law school. There were only about 200 people in law school. That was in all three classes. And you know, in the class we were in, I guess there were about 40 to 50 people in that class. We knew them all. We knew them to the point of knowing their families and their children and what they did after law school. Your daddy and I talked about all of them. All of them did well. Going to law school was just uh, truly the key, to the, the key to the courthouse door. Going to law school just opened up. Some, of course, did better than others, but all of them did well. Many judges came out of that. And many, um, you know, Howard Baker, as I've mentioned before, and they were just really provided the they were they were the cream of they were the cream of the crop. Now you shifted from pol from law into having an interest in politics, and when did that begin? Well, of course, um, although I really was always interested in going to law school and was interested in the legal profession, I had a family, which was my fir first and foremost concern, and uh, your brother, who is three and a half years older than you, when he started to school, then my obsession became getting him an education in good schools. And Marion County was not considered the best atmosphere for good schools. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe the way to have good schools was join the PTA. Well, I joined the PTA, and I later, I soon found out that was not where the decisions were made about schools, so I started uh, inquiring and I found that well it's the Board of Education that actually runs the schools. So I remembered um, going up through the ranks in the PTA and I remembered saying to the principal of the school when I was the president of the PTA, maybe I was the county council president or something at that time, why don't we have a meeting about uh, and invite the school board? Let that be our program for PTA. And he was horrified. Ah, he said leave the school board out of this. And we just really almost had words about, about why would we not have that for a PTA meeting. So I remember leaving there thinking, well, what is the school board? And whatever that is, I'm going to run for that thing. And so that would have been about 19 and uh, 63. So I began to inquire, how it is you run for the school board? And I found out there were two such things as uh, parties, political parties. Well, I knew about that before. But I found out that, you know, you had to qualify to run for political office. And you qualified under a party. And in Marion County, I was, uh, your father comes from a long line of Republicans. And uh, so that, that's sort of an, an, another story. I'll tell you briefly how I came to be a Republican. Uh, you know, I grew up in Greenville, which was Upper East Tennessee, but my father was from Virginia. And as I said, he was born in 1863. And so he was much a part of the old South and the Civil War scene. And he lived it he, till his dying day. And he felt a great loyalty to the Democratic Party and a great, uh, a great loyalty to the South and to the lost cause. And because of that, I thought, well, you know, if he's a Democrat, I'm a Democrat. And I was 22 years old when I was married, so I'd never voted. When you were, you didn't vote till you were 21. And so when your daddy and I married, your daddy was very gallant and we had a wonderful honeymoon. We went to New York City. We stayed at the Waldorf Astoria. Um, but we argued about politics. <laughs> <laughs> we argued about, I got, you know, I said, well, I'm a Democrat. And he, you know, he said something like, well, you can't be a Democrat and married to me. I'm a Republican. <laughs> and of course, I was, didn't, I was, I was enough emancipated by that time, I wasn't going to be told what to do there. So then we had another bone of contention. I would be, had been reared in the Methodist church. You, you know, that was my, my life growing up. My parents were very strong 
we all people of the Christian faith, and I'd grown up in the Methodist Church. Well, I couldn't imagine going anywhere else to church. So finally, I said to him one day, I tell you what, if you'll go to the Methodist Church, I'll be a Republican. <laughs> and he says, you got a deal. So after that, I became a Republican, and I was, uh, you know, I started reading what the Republican Party was about. And I said, well, you know, really, I, I believe in that. I am a Republican. I believe in the work ethic, and I believe that government should not do for what you can do for yourself, government should not do for you. And so it just went from there. So by, the by that time, I qualified as a Republican to run for the school board. And um, you ran countywide. And so, you know, I thought, well, you know, I've got to, your daddy says, well, to get elected for office, you got to go out and ask people to vote for you. And so I started out. And unfortunately, I did have the luxury of not being tied to a law practice. You know, I had a good husband who provided a roof, the necessities of life, and, and encouragement. And encourage, he wanted me. He encouraged me to do this. I think he says, I think you ought to do this. Help me. Would take me around to people he knew to get him to vote for me. And when were you elected to the school board? In nineteen sixty six. Okay. And how long did you serve on the school Twelve board? Twelve years. And then you, uh, there was a transition from politics back into law. Well, uh, of course, during that time, you and your brother had gone to, graduated. By that time, you had graduated from, um, really, college. You had graduated from high school and were in college by that time. And uh, I, there, were, there was a very controversial issue in Marion County over the schools which was a flaming issue at that time and is still a flaming issue today. And it was over the consolidation of high schools. And uh, I took a, the University of Tennessee provided great services to schools who would ask for them. And there was a man in the county by the name of Leonard Ralston who was a trustee for the University of Tennessee. And he says, you know, they have a service they provide to school systems they will come down and study a school system and just give you a recipe for how you ought to run that school system. And they did. And they came and uh, uh, we finally got that through the school board. It cost $8,000 to do it. And they brought about nine different professors. And over a period of six months, they came in and out of the whole county and they came back with a recommendation. And I thought that recommendation, at that time I knew very little about school administration. Highly political. The, the school system was highly political. And uh, uh, they came in with a recommendation of what we should do. One, and I still have that study. And uh, it was, it proved to be as true as the gospel. I mean, what they told us to do and what our schools. They took each system, each, sec, each segment of the school system, administration, uh, supportive services and broke it all down, involved the community, but there was such resistance to, to their recommendations that by 19 and uh, I guess 19 and 78, that would have been 12 years later, it was a very unpopular issue. The consolidating of the high school, very unpopular. <coughs> and uh, why did they recommend that? Well, the enrollment of the county was like, say, 6,000 students. And like in high school, grades 9 through 12, we would have had about 1,500 students. And the reason I say that it was so true that um, 20 years later, as well as of today, 19 and 2001, the enrollment of Marion County Schools is about 4,000. So the school has lost, the high schools have lost enrollment. The people have, many of the people have, uh, have come to have, um, not have confidence in the secondary program. They feel that it's not inadequate. But they still have kept the small fragmented high schools. So uh, I knew by 19 and uh, 78 that I should not, that I could not be reelected. By the way, they had a piece of legislation that, res that caused us to have to run by district. And I knew that particularly the district I lived in, where I had advocated consolidation, 
I knew that I couldn't be elected there. And by that time, uh, I'd become involved in the Tennessee School Boards Association, and that was really a fun group. I mean, uh, the, all the problems at home, you could leave behind you and go to Nashville and find people who really believed in education and uh, who talked the game of what good schools were. And it was great fun to come to Nashville. And by that time, I had, um, uh, was, on the, was on that board over there. And by that time, I was sort of, at, I, I became the president of that organization. Had the opportunity to be involved in picking some of the leadership today, who's still there today. And that was just, just a wonderful experience, a great time to come to Nashville. I used to say that the county seat was interesting when court was convening, and that Nashville was interesting when the legislature was convening. Washington was really exciting when Congress was in session, and that was true. And tell me about a little bit about the time you spend in Washington. Well, by that time, I was practicing law. And um, um, when it was 1980, I guess, and uh, I've said before that I'd become a, really a more ardent Republican than your daddy. He'd become sort of, you know, okay if they do, okay if they don't. But I'd become a really, I was, I'd become a true believer. And so I campaigned uh, for Ronald Reagan in a small way. I don't mean that I did anything significantly. So about 19, right after Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, well, I, I, was, a, I was a delegate to the, uh, no, I was not a delegate. I was, um, I was a, uh, whatever it is. I, I went to the, the alternate. I was an alternate delegate in 1976. And your daddy was a, was a we went to the national conventions. And so I had really become considered uh, a partisan Republican. And so not right after Ronald Reagan was elected, I remember saying to your daddy, uh, well, our children are out of school. We're still in pretty good health. Why don't we sell our house and we're both lawyers and go to Washington and get a job in the Reagan administration. And I said, it's going to be exciting up there. And so he says to me, well, the house is in your name. Sell it if you want to. I'm staying here and practicing law. So, well, of course, that's good enough for me. And so, I, you know, I had a, uh, a law practice that was, that was interesting and provided enough income that gave me a, that was sort of the, the icing on the cake. Uh, so one morning I opened my mail and there was a letter a copy of a letter from Lamar Alexander to somebody in Washington who said, I'm going to recommend a woman attorney in Tennessee for the Legal Services Corporation. And um, I didn't know what the Legal Services Corporation was, but I began to inquire. And I thought, well, I'd really like to do that. And one thing led to another. And so I was nominated by uh, Ronald Reagan for the Legal Services Corporation. My old friend Howard Baker was there in Washington. And I remember when we went up to our first meeting, we went to the White House for an interview the first time. Ken Cripps was the man who interviewed me at the White House. And uh, so I remember when we all got around to talk about, well, who, what's your political support? Uh, who do you need to get to help you? Get, you, you had to be, first you were nominated by the president she had to be confirmed by the Senate. And uh, so we were sort of talking about where we could get support. And they said to me, well, who do you know that can help you in Tennessee? And I said, well, the governor recommended me for this job. And I went to school with Howard Baker. And they said, well, you don't need anybody else. So with that, they, uh, there were, I think there were 11 members on that board. And they were from all over the nation. and. Uh, so I did that about three and a half years. And now your next appointment was President Bush appointed you. Well, to... that came out of the Department of Defense. Uh, there's a group called uh, the Defense Advisory Council for Women in the Services. And of course, with the, after serving on the legal services really for nearly four years, mm -hmm. uh, they they appointed a new board. Mm -hmm. I didn't. And now this was the first President Bush we're talking about. That's right. 
Uh, well, no, that was the still the Reagan. That okay. was the end of the Reagan years. And uh, <clears throat> then Bush was reelected. The first Bush was reelected. Was elected in nineteen and what ninety two? No, no, eighty eight. Eighty eight. And so it was during his administration this, that I received this call from the Pentagon and asked if I would serve on the Defense Advisory Council for Women in the Military. And that was a, just an advisory council. That was not as exciting as being on the legal services. And that was not who the was the person that swore you in for that? A Sandra Day O'Connor. And uh, I will tell you this, uh, the day of our confirmation, uh, Senator Gore just appeared. Nobody asked him. You know, I was not even knowledgeable enough about politics even then to know that you had your whole fa you should have your whole family come to these things. All these other members had their family and they were all standing up there kissing and crying and carrying on and I was up there by myself. I, it didn't occur to me to ask him. You said you would have come if you'd known about it. And so I was there and Sandra Day O'Connor was there and uh, I remember she had on white shoes that looked terrible with this black robe. <laughs> That's silly. And I looked up and there was uh, Senator Gore. And he, Senator Gore was very handsome. I mean, Senator Gore was just very, very handsome. And he just came, and I mean, you know, he, he, because I was from Tennessee. And we sat and talked a little bit, but, and I thanked him for coming. Uh -huh. But I didn't really think of it being and which so, Senator Gore was this? It was uh, Al Gore, who? the vice president, who became vice the vice president. He was very, he didn't make a big to-do about, uh, he just sort of mentioned, you know, that he was glad that somebody from Tennessee was going to be on the legal services. And uh, so we sat and talked about it, and he got up and left, and we said goodbye, and Sandra Day O'Connor swore us in, and I still have the Red Bible. and. The chaplain of the Senate wrote uh, to Claude Swafford and said something about his tenure on the legal services. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me again Not, yeah, that was the, uh, about the, uh, as you were transitioning into the practice of law. Well, let's see, it came about like this. Um, I had always sort of done I guess you'd call it curbstone practice when people wanted a cheap will or didn't want to pay a lawyer or something, they'd call me up and I could always, I always had access to your daddy's office and his secretaries. And uh, in 1976, I realized that my, that I had run afoul of the prevailing view for education in Marion County and that I could not be elected. Uh, to the school board again. So um, I thought, well, you know, in the meantime, I had managed to get a master's degree in school administration. And I thought, well, you know, why don't I just run for su school superintendent? I know I couldn't be elected to the school board again, so I did qualify. Well, I went to, um, I went over to, um, I had this man tell me, why don't you do something about uh, what every uh, legislator should know about schools. So I remembered there was a man by the name of Dr. Sam Ingram who had been on the study force and at that time he was the commissioner of education. And I called up Dr. Ingram and said, how about me coming over here and uh, sitting in your, in, being in and out of your office and interviewing all of these people in the State Department on education. Well, he thought that was okay if I wanted to do that. So I did, and I went over there, and uh, while I was there, I thought, well, you know, if I had a, I do have this master's degree, if I had a certificate to be a school superintendent, I could run for school superintendent. So I talked to Dr. Ingram about it, and so he just told me to come over and meet with the, Board of Edu the State Board of Education. So I did, and I did not have the experience uh, of teaching that you were supposed to have. So I met with the state board and I, my position was that I had served on the school board for 12 years and that I'd held all these offices and would they use that in lieu of teaching experience? And they did and they gave me a superintendent certificate. But that's a long story too. There were those who had opposed me in the past and who questioned that and they brought it back up to the 
Board of Education and ask them to rescind it. And, uh, but they didn't. They did not. The State Board of Education did not rescind it. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to run for office and then when I tried to qualify, the local election commission wouldn't put me on the ballot because they said that my qualifications were not good enough, were not adequate. So with that, your daddy filed, of course, a, a, uh, filed a suit in Chancery to qualify me. And uh, that was another story too, the Chancery held in, in my favor and I was put on the ballot. But then I was defeated at the poll for superintendent. So I thought, well, education is over, I'll do something else. So I came home and decided mm -hmm. to really, by that time, there was certainly no stigma against women lawyers, you know. Mm -hmm. Anybody could help you, that's what people, that's what people equate for competence in a lawyer, somebody who can win for them, who can get what they want, who can mm -hmm. represent them successfully. So I came back and uh, owned this old building in um, South Pittsburgh that was um, sort of run down. Fixed it up, rented the bottom floor to a drugstore, mm -hmm. took the second floor and fixed up an office. Your daddy encouraged me to do that. Uh, uh, I had $500. I bought, spent $250 on the code when that was, whoever that was. Anyway, I got a whole set of the code, Tennessee code annotated for $250. Bought 20 yards of material and made tie back curtains. This was an upstairs room of an old building, great big windows. Made curtains for, tie back curtains for all those windows. Had five windows in my office. And uh, bought a, went to a sort of a second handed store and bought a, what appeared to be an oriental rug and fixed me up some shelves and painted the shelves red inside and had some antique chairs that I had. They were, they were in the building. They were in the building. Uh, they were pretty old chairs. I still have them. Do and you remember your first client that walked in the door? I do. I do. A man who worked for the stove foundry across the street. I came over and I had known him or he knew dad, your daddy or something and he said, now I tell you, Miss Claudie, says these fellers over here that are in the union come over here and meet says if they give you any trouble just call on me i'll take care of you <laughs> and his name was duck king and duck king came up and says hey do you fill out income taxes and i said sure <laughs> and i had not seen an income tax since judge ralston's days <laughs> i still knew it was the 1040 form and uh, so he brought his income tax out. He paid him $5. He sent somebody else over, filled out their income tax. Uh, somebody else came up who had had a car wreck. <laughs> so uh, we uh, represented, this was a woman, and we were, she was the wife of somebody that was connected with them. So she had had a car wreck, and I think I got a $1,400. No, I did not. I got a four, My first year, I made $400. The whole year, I had $400. And the second year, I made $800. And the third year, I made $1,600, and I sort of lost track of it after that. But it began to get a little better, a little better, and a little better. And then a man walked in and asked me if I could do Social Security cases disability cases and really I was not, Social Security disability was not a very well known area of the law at that time. It was really considered administrative law and in Marion County there was not much recognition either. You had a case, you either, you sued and you tried it in Sessions Court or Circuit or Chancery Court and there were the lawyers, the local lawyers uh, were really not involved even in 1976 in any administrative law. So somehow I read in the paper where the Chattanooga Bar Association was gonna do a seminar on Social Security, and it was free. So I remember going over to that, and I remember there was, um, the federal judge was on the panel, Judge Wilson, and there were two lawyers, two other lawyers um, on that panel, and so that opened up a segment of the law to me that I had not heard about, Social Security. 
So this, when this man asked me about it, you know, I said, well, you know, sure. So anyway, I represented him and um, got in the, the social, the administrative courts are much, much less formal than, uh, than the state courts, much less formal. Uh, the, the procedure, there's not the formality of procedure. And so I was fortunate enough to have a judge that sort of just walked me through it. Took over my first hearing, questioned the claimant, and uh, it sort of told me, and ruled from the bench. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then took me back into chambers and sort of told me what was going on. You know, the lawyers are good about that. Some of them are, some of them are not. Mm -hmm. Let's take a little break and then we'll finish up here in just a few minutes. Tell me about your family. How many children do you have? Well, I have two children. I have a son born in 1951 while your daddy was in the Korean conflict. He is uh, Howard Graham Swafford III. He practices law with your daddy today on the courthouse square in Jasper in a law firm that was uh, established in 1895. They think it's probably one of the second or third oldest firms in the state. Uh, Graham is, uh, um, has been practicing law now, I guess about close to 25 years. Then I have a daughter, Claudia, who went to the University of Tennessee undergraduate school and the UT College of Law and uh, married William Haltom, who is also a lawyer is also from Memphis, Tennessee, and she moved to Memphis with Billy Alton. And Billy practices law in Memphis, and Claudia is a juvenile court referee in Shelby County, and has been for about seven years, eight years, seven or eight years. And Claudia and Bill have three children, Will, who is 16, Ken, who is 12, and Margaret Grace, who is six. And then Graham's children are, uh, he has a son, Howard Graham Swafford III, who says he does not want to go to law school, shows no interest in law school. He has a daughter, Shelton Swafford, who's a freshman at UT, who's never said she wanted to do anything else but go to law school, and is working this summer in the law office. And uh, is, uh, for a 19-year-old, uh, shows considerable promise. She's very assertive and, and very smart, and I think she'll go to law school. Do you think she could have run an ice plant a few years back? If the, if the need were there, Shelton is, Shelton is the most take a whole person I, next to you, next to my daughter Claudia. <laughs> my daughter Claudia, when I was running for office for the school board, I remember I came home one day after being out searching for votes. Uh, she said, come in, I have dinner ready, I have hot rolls, and you were in the fifth grade. That was fun. And I came into a wonderful hot meal, and <laughs> so we, and you and your friends got out and campaigned for me. No, that was, that was when your daddy was running for the legislature. Mm -hmm. You and your mm -hmm. friends. We've always been involved in politics, mm -hmm. to some extent. Now, did you ever consider practicing law with Howard or Graham in the... Uh, not really, office. not really. We lived in South Pittsburgh. Their office was in the county seat, which was Jasper, six miles away. Uh, had this building that uh, your daddy had bought for me, uh, an old, old building. And I was able to fix that building up and rent the downstairs for a drugstore. And the upstairs had uh, three large rooms and rooms with great big windows and really uh, architectural values. It was built in about 1911. And it was a very pretty old building which had run down. And so that's the building I fixed up. And uh, I had an office up there in the upstairs. And then I had a part of that 
building or part of that area, there was a dry cleaners there, and they were good people, and they would always, uh, when I needed witnesses to wills, well, I could always call on the people who ran the dry cleaning to, if they were busy, I'd take my client down there, but generally they'd come up to my office, and we'd, they got into it, and I'd, I bartered services, I did wills for them, and uh, then they would be witnesses for me, and the man who ran the drugstore was a, a very uh, neighborly sort of fellow, and he always looked out to be sure I'd locked up at night. And he had, sometimes if I'd forget to lock the doors, he'd check and lock the doors for me. And he was uh, sending me business, and you know, they were just good people. As you look back over your career, is there anything you would have changed or done differently? I'm sure there are, but I don't really like to dwell on what could have been uh -huh. because I really had a very satisfactory life, a very good life, a very happy life, and sort of like Barbara Bush said, you know, the best of all is a good family, a good and loving husband and good children, and uh, really the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest judgment you might have gotten, the biggest appointment you might have gotten, all of it pales in comparison to a good and happy family. Now, as you've begun to slow down your law practice, what else have you been doing? Well, um, I spent uh, about 20 years trying to talk your daddy into going to Florida in the wintertime. And uh, finally did succeed in getting him to get a place in Boca Raton, Florida. And, uh, uh, but I've always had an interest in politics, and I certainly have had, always had an interest in the public schools in Marion County. And more than anything, when you practice law in a rural county like Marion County, it's not hard to make the comparison between a poor education and the troubles that follow. Not able to get good jobs, don't, not able to have good home lives, don't marry well, don't marry at all, have children out of wedlock. So to me, the, the, basis, of, of, the basis of that, the basis of uh, quality life for people is first uh, a matter of the spirit and then education. If they have no values, if they're taught no values that come from a faith, uh, they, they have no, they have no values on which to stand. Uh, I read one of the, I guess people talk about role models. I've read a number of Margaret Thatcher's biographies. And Margaret Thatcher, if I have anyone I really and truly admire, it is Margaret, it's in political circles, it is truly Margaret Thatcher. Uh, her first involvement in politics was in education. She was the Minister of Education as a member of Parliament. And she tells about all of her problems there. It's interesting how similar they were to the problems in Marion County. So I'd always had an interest in education. And uh, the, I mentioned uh, the need to consolidate this, the high schools. And it's really gotten worse because the cost has gone up, the enrollment has gone down, the offerings are have come, become poorer and poorer. I have friends that, I'm in, that I get together with and we talk about politics. And so one day we were just talking about, well, who's gonna run for the school board in Marion County? And we talked and talked and talked about it and we talked to people about doing it. And finally one day I thought, well, maybe I ought to do that. So that would have been in 1998 and so I did. And the, the rest is history. And, and I will say this. You being, were elected in 1998. I was elected in 1998. And, and at the first meeting, who was elected chairman well, of the board? Um, well, I was, but the thing about it is, in my other tenure, my former tenure on the school board, uh, I was always in the minority, always in the minority. I mean, I thought we ought to consolidate the high schools. I thought we ought to do a lot of things. I thought we ought to get a good superintendent who knew something about education. I thought we ought to appoint the superintendent. All of that was unpopular. Now, all of that's a possibility. What I mean is the legislature 
in 1990 passed legislation that provided for the school board to appoint the superintendent. And that's really your key to education. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I came into a different climate and a different environment. And people now sort of took the position that I must really be interested in education or why would I in the winter of my life decide to serve on a school board. Mm -hmm. So, and it really is the one real pleasure of being on the school board now is the fact that we named, we have a superintendent of schools that did not have to run for political office, but that the school board interviewed and they, they sought a quality person. They didn't wait to just see who wanted to do the job. And that person was, we, we were able to unanimously select a superintendent of schools. And that has just made the difference between day and night in the administration of schools. I no longer am involved in, in the first part of, the first year I was on the school board, I was in the, down at the central office on a daily basis, making day-to-day -day decisions, helping making day-to-day -day decisions. Well, that's not the way the schools should run. The school board members should develop policy, get good people to do the job, and we have a superintendent that is, came from, a, from out of the state who had, had a track record of running an excellent school system. He's been on the job for a year, and he has just brought a tremendous amount of respect to, this, to the system. He has, while he's been there, he's gotten two of the schools accredited. None of our schools were accredited. Mm -hmm. He's able to work with the school board members in a very, uh, 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 in a good environment, which we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. We had a very negative environment. We had a negative uh, situation where the, the Board of Education and the Teachers Association were antagonistic. Mm -hmm. He's helped to solve some of those problems. Now, going back to your grandchildren, you think your granddaughter Shelton? I think my granddaughter will, Shelton. Will go to I'm law hoping school. that she will go to law school. I'm and hoping that she will go to the University of Tennessee, as many as nearly all of us have. And as a lawyer, how do you see that her career may be similar to yours or different from yours? Well, I don't think that she will have any problem. First of all, she, when she went to the University of Tennessee, she looks around the legal community in Knoxville and gets herself a job in a law office there. Where does she work? Well, she works for Charles Swanson, I believe, in Knoxville. And I think maybe you knew him and pointed her in that direction. And she, they like her a lot, and they were. She works three days a week there after school, and she came home and told her daddy she needed to work in his office. And uh, you know, they there in Jasper, they sort of have a good old boy operation where the, some sometimes they help bring their children to work. And <laughs> well, in terms of the firm of the future, what kind of firm do you see Shelton Swafford? Uh, going into well, uh, what kind of profession do you see Shelton Swafford in? She is very much a daughter of the valley. That's Sequatchie Valley. She is knows who she's kin to. She's uh, uh, well known in the courthouse. The, all the courthouse people know her. She since she was a little girl. She's uh, you know when I went to law school, I didn't know what. Uh, I didn't know the difference between a defendant and a, and a plaintiff. I didn't know, as I said, I didn't know what torts were. She knows the other day I went in the office and she was preparing a deed of trust. And she has, you know, she, she has the, the advantage of growing up in a, uh, in a legal environment, in a, in a lawyer's family. And we talk about it. I mean, you know, we talk about our cases. We talk about, uh, well, I mean, we certainly do preserve uh, uh, confidentiality. And we're very, I mean, I, we've always made it a point to not talk about just an everyday conversation with people. We don't even talk about who we represent. It's, it's all right for them to tell that we're their lawyer, but, but we don't. And she understands, she understands all of that. 
she understands you might, when there's just you and your family at the dinner table, you hash out uh, issues. Your, your good husband, Billy, made an interesting remark. Come to visit his in-laws is like coming to a CLE meeting. <laughs> and, uh, and we had some really spirited discussions. And of course, Shelton does come from a, a uh, more politically liberal bent than I do. I come from a bent that is sort of reflected when somebody asked Margaret Thatcher if she was sort of a victim of the Victorian area. She says, oh, I certainly am. My grandmother, who was a wonderful Victorian lady, had a great influence over me. She taught me the value of work. She taught me uh, to tell the truth. She taught me to not live beyond my means. She taught me, and see, Shelton doesn't come from, she comes from easy living. Life has not been hard for her. Well, as a, a final question on this, what do you see the role of lawyers today and as your granddaughter anticipates the practice of law, the role that she will step into? Well, uh, the role of lawyers is today, as it has always been, to provide uh, uh, help to those to provide legal uh, help to those who need legal services and sometimes they don't really need legal services. They need, what they need is to help them solve their problems. And I do have a real, uh, a real concern about the legal profession today in that they make easy questions, hard questions. They make things that could be settled much easier because there's a tendency to, if you can't bill out hours, you can't charge a very good fee. And if you don't, if you can settle an issue and uh, without a lot of depositions and a lot of, uh, well, your daddy would call it a lot of rigmarole, you don't, but, but then I guess overheads of law offices have gotten so great that lawyers are under great cr pressure to, um, to finance to be able to, to pay the bills. But it does seem to me that there is a great tendency and I, in, the, in the school, in school law now, 30 years ago there was very little school law. That's a whole body of law. A whole body of law, school law is. And I, I tend to see people who sue the schools with frivolous causes. And I'll tell you another thing I have a real problem with are uh, all this mediation and arbitration. And the reason I say that is it's a lot easier to bring a frivolous cause if you're only going to mediate it. Uh, I find that um, that mediators do not decide issues based on precedent as the courts do. And I believe there's a great value to looking back to what has been. And of course, that's the whole body of law. What is your, uh, I've had the judge say to many time, me to many times, what's your precedent on this, on this subject? And when you can say that such and such a case, is, you know, supports the, your position, that's the way, the, that's the way law operates. And I, I really have a concern about all these cases being mediated because I, I just feel they, I think that, that precedent is an important part of the law. Mm -hmm. And lawyers in the community, what do, role do you well, see I for lawyers in the community? Well, I have a feeling about that too. I feel that lawyers should, are the people who should be willing to man the not so prestigious jobs. They should be willing to run for the school board, to serve on the county commissions, to serve on the city council, to serve on the hospital board. There, there's no shortage of people who will serve on the bank boards. And there's uh, usually some prestige connected with serving on the hospital boards. But the school boards and the county commission and to, to provide the leadership in the churches, uh, to, to be the scout leaders in the community. Uh, it's, it's, it's the lawyers who have been trained to 
to marshal their thoughts and to focus their ideas and to provide for leadership and good government and to provide leadership and let me not say, hey, let me say, in the churches to be willing to do the, the not so glamorous jobs in the church, like teaching the Sunday school classes. And that's where you teach children values. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for the time you've spent here with us and for the lessons we've learned. Well, it's been great fun. Thank you.